Question of the day, what is your favorite video game licensed game? Now, there aren't a lot of those on the table, but when it comes to it, there have been several. There's been Mega Man, Street Fighter's upcoming, there is what we're talking about today, and then there was Dark Souls. So what is your favorite video game property that's been adapted into a board game? Today, we're talking about Bloodborne. This is a Lovecraftian, although not in name. There's never anything called Cthulhu or Shoggoths or anything like that. But the feeling is there, that cosmic dread and cosmic terror in an amazing uh, gothic horror setting. All It's a PlayStation exclusive that has now come to the tabletop. Full disclosure, I love Bloodborne the video game. It's one of my favorite video games of all time. It's just so much fun and angering. It will make you angry, but that's kind of part of it. So we're going to take a look now at how it translates to a board game right now. So this is Bloodborne set up. Currently we've got it for three hunters out here. We have the three different types. The miniatures here also show and correspond to whichever hunter board you get. Everyone gets a hunter dashboard and then one type of hunter. So this is the saw cleaver one, basically the main one from the game, costume wise. Uh, and then it has two sides. So you've got the saw cleaver extended and then the saw cleaver when it's half. If you played the game, you know that the whole point of the game is all about speed and agility and dodging and quickly attacking. So you're switching this back and forth mid game in order to use these different attacks. On your turn, you have a deck of cards that you're gonna have a certain hand of made up of basic cards, as well as the ability to upgrade in the Hunter's Dream over there, which we'll talk about in a minute. But you have these basic cards and you start with three of them in your hand. On your turn, what you can do is you can play as many as you want. When you want to do something like move, you're going to just discard a card over here, right? So discard to move, discard to interact. There'll be tokens out on the board. There'll be consumables, which are decks of cards that correspond to items that you would use in the game, like uh, bolt paper, uh, throwing knives, sedatives, cold blood dew, and all this sort of stuff that just does stuff uh, throughout the game. You have those available to you. On your turn, if you're gonna attack though, you're gonna take one of the cards and put it in one of these slots. Now they do certain things, this one boost damage. So you might uh, put it here. Let's just say we're doing quick cut. Now this quick cut would normally do one damage, but now it's doing two damage with a speed of three. Speed is what really determines anything. Certain things called stagger and uh, a turn, the amount of when attacks happen uh, is based on speed. So if you have a three speed and your enemy has a two speed, your attack could hit first and potentially kill them and then also, you have things like Stagger again, which is going to shut them down completely, but it's all about that speed right there. You also have your pistol or your different types of guns that you'll have starting out. This can be flipped, and if an enemy does a basic attack, you have the chance to do it. Now, the way the enemies work is they have a generic deck for the basic enemies, and I'm going to show you them, and it says Special, Basic, and Ability. Those are the three things it could be. There's three basic two special, one ability. So you know what's coming. The deck doesn't shuffle until it's ended, but the enemy cards look something like this. You have the mob here, that's their basic attack. It's a two speed, two damage. This is a one speed, four damage, pretty strong. But the backside is different. So when you play, you shuffle these up and decide which side you're gonna play with. Corresponding to the symbol up there is where, let's see if I can zoom in on that, is where those will spawn out onto the board. So one, two, three symbols. On the board here, you'll notice that those symbols are out here so that would enemy that corresponds to that symbol would spawn here when it spawns back to this if these are ever full the only way to empty them out is to flip them over with discarding a card to switch your trick weapon and those slots become available if for instance you have a dodge card but you have a full slots down here you wouldn't be able to dodge ordinarily you could dodge during your turn Basically, you're gonna be moving around, interacting, fighting, going through this mission deck. Now, I'm purposely not gonna show you the mission deck, but this is currently Growing Madness. There are four missions in the base set, four chapters, and there's a lot of content in each chapter, uh, excuse me, in each campaign. Three chapters in this campaign, plus there's three other campaigns in there. A lot of content, a lot of stuff to choose from. Also, I wanted to show you the miniatures. This is one of the bosses. I believe this is the uh, Cleric Beast. Is that right? That doesn't sound right. Yeah, that's the Cleric Beast. I know this, I've played it and I've almost beat it, but. Some reason I can't think of it. Bloodstar Beast here. I mean, look at that. They've done a really good job of getting just the grotesqueness of Bloodborne as well as nice solid miniatures. Church Giants, this is one of my favorite enemies in the entire game to fight. They look great and they're huge by comparison to the Hunter. The scale is fantastic in this game. 
Uh, here's the away, away, those kind of guys right there. They look great straight out of the game, as well as there's Father Gascon. He's right there and uh, looks great. So some of the bosses are the ones I just showed you as well as Sister Amelia. Four different types of hunters to choose from as well as there's some extra content there. If you get the Hunter's Dream expansion and the Chalice Dungeon, you can mix and match all that stuff as well. Plus Chalice Dungeon makes it PvP. But essentially on your turn, you're gonna be exploring these tiles. The tiles will add up based on what the setup for the chapter says. So chapter one, and again, I'm not gonna show you, of the Growing Madness tells you which tiles to put out here. Usually it's just the central lamp. And some of these tiles have special rules about what you can do on them. Now what's cool is, because again, the game is all about speed and aggroing enemies, etc. If you were to attack an enemy, they'll attack you at the same time. It's not the case though, where if you try to run away from them and they attack you and you don't get to attack them back, attacks are always the same time, which means you could just spend your turn doing stuff and then when they attack, you still get to attack and if you're faster, you might be able to still kill them before they hit you. You can gain consumables, you can gain certain insight tokens from the board from different insight missions. So there's insight missions and hunt missions inside of each chapter, inside of each campaign that you're going to need to reconcile in order to move to the next part of it. Some of those might be boss fights, and I'll show you boss fights look different because, for instance, Father Gasco in here has his own fighting cards instead of the generic deck, as well as his own health deck, uh, health cards here. So oh, here they are. There's the Cleric Beast, uh, the Father of Gasco and Transform, Blood Starved Beast, and then Vicar Amelia. So you have all those different ones there. There's a lot of different weapons you can pick up throughout the game as well. Uh, the sidearms, I mean, as well as a bunch of consumables and some unique items that do certain things that you're going to get as rewards based on these insight missions. If you were to take six damage, you would return to the Hunter's Dream. Also, there's a track up there, which is Hunter's Dream. This is the round tracker. If you ever reach the end of the round track, you get one more turn and then the entire campaign, not chapter, resets. It sounds horrible, but again, this plays very quickly. Your turns move very, very, very fast. So even resetting is not the worst thing in the world. If you're to kill an enemy, you'll gain a blood echo, which will be spent mandatory for upgrades. Those four cards you shuffle and get four to start with, spend your blood echoes to gain upgrades, then you change out your deck. You can only ever have a certain amount of cards, so you have to kind of pick and choose which ones you want to use. You then also come back to the central lamp and then you do it again. If you hit the red spaces up there on the track, the board resets, and I say resets, I mean everything respawns, consumables respawn, enemies respawn, etc. And then your bosses will heal unless you've made it to phase two of the boss. If you made it to phase two, they stay at phase two. That's how you play Bloodborne. That's just an overview of how to play the game. Again, there are four different campaigns in here. The miniatures are just top notch. It's some of the best uh, miniatures out there, again, because it's you know it's cool when you're not with that. But you've got four different ones. You've got the Fall of Old Yarnum. You've got the Long Hunt and then Secrets of the Church. So you're going to kind of get an idea of what those are going to be about if you've played them. If you haven't played them, uh, just know that there's a lot of variety. These are some of the other allies and characters that you might encounter that are, you'll fight potentially, as well as different hunters here. This is from some of the expansion stuff. But a lot of meat on this bone with Bloodborne. So that was Bloodborne. Let's talk first and foremost. Obviously, the game looks incredible. I mean, it really does. The miniatures are top-notch. They capture the, the art and style of the game so well. I mean, the monsters are nasty, they're ugly, but they're also nice and chunky and clunky. The Church of Giant itself is just a regular enemy that looks so good. They managed to capture the look of these characters perfectly. Uh, so presentation is great. The art, the tile on the art themselves looks good with the blue, and it just really matches the way the game looks. The hunter boards are nice. I would like to have been those a little thicker cardboard instead of paper, but you know, it is what it is. But the game itself, art style makes sense too. When you flip your stuff, it just makes sense art direction. So presentation art looks incredible. It's, it's a fantastic looking game, especially if you like that gothic horror game. Now, then let's talk about how the game plays, the mechanics. It's very, a lot of content in this first box, first and foremost, because there's three chapters per, or at least three chapters per, and then there's four separate campaigns in the core box. That's a lot of content, and it's not something where you can play only once and you're done, not at all. It rewards you based on playing multiple times and multiple times and multiple times, much like the game does itself. Um, Difficulty level. It's very hard. It's a hard co-op game. You have to plan ahead. And part of the fun is knowing that you might lose and come back. The thing is, though, what makes it good about that 
is it's not very long. Like the the campaign isn't like each time you play is very quick. It can be each run, I should say, all the way to the end. Even if you had to restart the whole campaign over, can be quick. The only slow part would be finding those cards and putting the tokens back on them. But other than that, it plays really, really quick. Like your turns are fast, even combat. Now let's talk combat because this is a majority of the game is fighting. It is one of the best combat systems I've ever seen because the combat happens so fast. It doesn't just pause the game and bog down. It's quick. Part of your turn is like, I'm going to attack that one. Or if I wait, he's going to attack me, but I still get to slash back. The speed, paper, rock, scissors sort of deal is really, really good. Being able to stagger, is, is it's so thematic. It works like the games where if you use your gun and stagger them, you can hit them without them hitting you. It's just, the combat was thought out so well. It might be one of my favorite tabletop combat systems, period. I love how you choose your card and it becomes, you know, based on where you put it, it could do less damage, but a faster strike, you can add buffs to it. It very well might be my favorite combat system in a in a board game style game. I would like to see more games do this, but then again, it works with the style of the game with the trick weapons and flipping them. I think having the, the slots be filled and then you have to flip it and use the backside and then flip back and all that stuff, I think that's brilliant. I think it really, really, really captures Bloodborne on the table. The missions themselves are fun, very difficult, um, but not to the point of impossibility. Like there's a there's a path to the end. You can see it, you can do it. It's just a matter of getting there and doing it. Uh, I, I love this. I think it's a I think it's an eight eight and a half out of ten. It's just so so good. It looks good on the table. It's fun. It's rewarding. It's brutal at times, but it's a very 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 good game. And that doesn't always happen when you have a property that's very popular translate to a different medium. This one does it, and it knocks it out of the park. Bloodborne is a fantastic game. If you don't know anything about the games, it doesn't matter. It plays a lot like a gothic horror mansions of madness almost. You're exploring. You're killing. You're you're interacting. You're doing these things. You're just no app. It's card drawing.